to welcome you on behalf of the Board of Miami Beach United to tonight's forum. And I wanted to thank the Miami Beach Women's Club for hosting us. Um, we have a little bit of a change in the guard, so we're looking for the light switches and turning down the AC, so bear with us as we get sorted out. Um, I wanted to also let you know um, that there are folks in the room who are running for office. Too many to name, but if you are interested in finding out more about any of them, feel free to uh, reach out to him or to her after the, the panel tonight. Um, another housekeeping event, if you don't know about the Miami Beach United website, it has been updated, so you can find all sorts of great information there, our resolutions, our newsletters, um, videos of past forums, if you weren't able to make uh, make it to one of our events, you can watch it online. Um, there's a newsletter sign up, there's pretty much everything you need to know about Miami Beach United, and there's also a way to get in touch with us if you have ideas or suggestions or need help. Um, you can send us a note and somebody will get back to you pretty quickly. Um, we are going to have a membership event on, uh, in June at the Standard, which we're pretty excited about. Seems like kind of a perfect location for a steamy summer night. And uh, we hope that if you're not already a member of Miami Beach United, you take that as an occasion to join the organization for only $25. You become a member for the year, get free access to all of the member events, and um, you ha help fund events like this, which are free and open to the public. Yeah. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists and the topic of tonight's conversation. And um, and um, it's going to be a little bit different than they've been in the past. You can tell we don't have tables uh, set up. It's going to be a little bit more of a conversation rather than um, people being uh, you know, presented to. Because this is a topic that's a really uh, kind of a hot one right now. I think we've all noticed this in our own neighborhoods or when we go uh, patrolling around the city doing errands or visiting friends or going for the run or whatever it is we do. But there's a lot of empty storefront going on in Miami Beach right now. And that is contributing to really kind of down in the dumps feeling in certain neighborhoods and underutilized space. And even on Lincoln Road or other corners and stretches that are um, high value retail, um, we're really seeing um, a missed opportunity. And it's not just Miami Beach, I mean, plus anybody uh, be under that delusion. It's happening around the world, it's happening all over the country. My daughter goes to school in New York and I was walking down Fifth Avenue in prime corner retail, plate glass, historic buildings, wide open, available for rent. So the challenge before us is how do we reinvest, uh, reignite and resuscitate and, and um, reactivate different neighborhoods, different storefronts uh, for different purposes around the city? And how do we do that uh, in a way that engages the community and helps build a sense of place and rebuild a sense of community? So that is our topic tonight. We are going to hear from our four um, esteemed panelists. It's going to be a conversation among them led, sort of shaped by Susan Askew, um, and then we're going to turn it over to you guys for questions um, uh, about two-thirds of the way through the program. So let me um, get out my notes and introduce Susan, who is going to be the, the moderator, as I mentioned. She is the founder and editor of RIE Miami Beach, and she's really our eyes and ears on the ground. What's going on in Miami Beach, connecting to City Hall and to residents' interests, she is a good person to, uh, to read and to follow. Um, the mission of her publication is to encourage a collaborative dialogue among the city and its residents, businesses, and investors for a better Miami Beach. She's also the founder of Rian Amara, a real estate investment company focused on rehabbing old properties, preserving character while updating them for today's lifestyles, both in Miami Beach and Alexandria, Virginia. Um, Saul Gross, does everybody know Saul? Anyone here? Who doesn't know Saul? That's probably a better question. He is the founder and CEO of Streamline Properties. He's a well-known civic and business leader in Miami Beach with over 30 years experience in the real estate industry as a broker, developer, and landlord. He's an award-winning pioneer in helping revitalize art deco buildings in the Flamingo Park neighborhood, among others, and to recognize the potential of Washington Avenue. Saul was elected Miami Beach Commissioner from 2001 to 2009. 
He also served as the chairman of the City of Miami Beach Design Review Board, chairman of the Business Resolution Task Force, and was on the Board of Governors of the Miami Beach Chamber of Commerce. He chaired the Washington Avenue Blue Ribbon Panel, um, which uh, sort of set the motion of a revitalization process for Washington Avenue. And in his spare time, he is a founding and still active board member of Miami Beach United. Um, I would like to introduce our new uh, Director of Economic Development for the City of Miami Beach, Bo Martinez. He's been here for about eight minutes and he's hit the ground running to say the least. The poor man has just been inundated. Very smart. But we are thrilled to have him and I hope you join me in welcoming him to the city. Um, he comes to us from the city and county of Greenfield, Colorado. Uh, but most recently, he has a wealth of relevant experience working with various governments across the U.S including Phoenix and Denver, um, and he has covered such really important um, uh, missions as directing uh, the city's neighborhood marketplace initiative, business retention, expansion, and attraction programs. His career has been built on development, connecting people and jobs, and ultimately facilitating community revitalization. Kind of perfect for the topic at hand, I would say. Um, and then last but not least, we have a guest from across the water. Elizabeth Plato Zyberg is an award-winning architect and an urban designer and planner, and is a is the founder, the founder of uh, DPZ, which I'm sure everybody is very familiar with um, here living here in Miami Beach. Um, she has, uh, excuse me, <laughs> make it short. Well. She's fabulous, that's a short version, but she's done all sorts of things, large and small scale, county, city, town, building design, street, streetscapes, and in addition to her um, design and planning work, she has also co-authored a book called The Suburban Nation, The Rise of Sprawl and Decline of the American Dream. Uh, she has maintained a career-long affiliation with the University of Miami School of Architecture, and she continues to teach there after 18 years as dean of the school. So, I would think you would agree we have a terrific panel to talk about the issues. And without further ado, I'm going to let them do the talking. Thank you, Tanya, and welcome to all of you who came out tonight on this beautiful evening, spending your time with us. I am certain this is going to be a lively conversation, um, and one that could fill many more hours than the time we have tonight. So I'm going to try to help us like, frame the issues briefly, but then turn to a conversation about solutions and what we might be able to take away tonight to implement here in uh, Miami Beach. No idea is too crazy. Let's think outside the box um, and, and have a, a good dialogue. Liz, we're going to ask you just to set up a little bit what lean urbanism is and um, how that might apply to our conversation tonight. Uh, well, Susan, I wonder if before that I could just say a few things about retail, the larger retail context. Yeah, absolutely. That's one, of, one of the things we talked about are the, the issues of, of retail, right? And what we're able to control. Online shopping, for example, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the economic forces, things we can't control, right? So let's set that up and then talk about real time. So, um, you know what, if you're going to speak about retail these days, you need to understand um, that it's, it has an ambiguous and unpredictable context, uh, like everything else one might say. Um, between store closings and store bankruptcies, the internet, as Susan said, um, the younger generations, traditionally those interested in acquiring stuff, no longer are. The ex geners and millennials really don't want stuff. If you've ever tried to give them any of your antiques, you will know that right away. Um, and maybe less well known are some of the real estate plays that are affecting um, uh, retail, places of retail, um, like including the downfall of chains like Sears, um, which, in which the takeover really um, is about the real estate that it's on, that could be a longer story. Um, retail has always been cannibalistic, eating its own as it evolves. From the late 19th century department stores, um, who were the first killers of Main Street, um, to the early small suburban shopping centers, and successive generations of centers and malls expanding geographically out of the core, always leaving something empty behind. 
Uh, now even malls are part of the decline. Um, so it seems like every generation has something new to deal with. Um, uh, so it's obvious that retail needs to be responsive to constant change. Uh, I'd like to give you, at some point, I'll give you some local experiences, but I think probably uh, I should move on to what you asked for, which is the lean urbanism. Um, I think all of those experiences that I might talk about later uh, are about turning to non-conventional situations and ideas and practices and always about lowering expectations because when retail is, is successful, um, the expectations for the returns rise um, and uh, some of the most interesting retail that can respond to difficult situations occurs um, really only when the, prep, when the values have dropped very low. So Detroit right now is a very interesting place for retail and residents, uh, restaurants, including um, apparently some very interesting design work that's going on. Um, and that has to do with the fact that there were zero values and the values were zeroed out to some degree and um, people began to realize that they could come in and really be creative and the kind of people who don't want to buy stuff started um, in fact to become retailers. Uh, and I should add that one of the interesting things is they started from the alleys, from the back door out. Um, and that is a lean approach. So lean urbanism is a small scale, incremental community building approach that requires fewer resources to incubate and mature. So it speaks to um, lower expectations. It's a movement of builders, planners, architects, developers, engineers, activists, non-for-profits, municipalities, and entrepreneurs who are all working to lower the barriers to community building to make it easier to start businesses and to provide more attainable housing and development. It's trying to make small possible again um, because in fact um, large is ever more encouraged by um, various influences including the bureaucracy and financing. Uh, we need them both. So there is a spectrum of activity um, from the, let's say, the highest lean, which might be if you're doing a new development that you don't expect a lot of retail there. You might allow single-story buildings like the old main streets of small American towns instead of thinking of a five-story or a larger mixed-use building. Uh, but that's still the single developer-driven large finance kind of operation. Um, the midpoint, um, something that releases regulations for specific development activity in existing places might be someplace like Wynwood. Um, Wynwood Yard um, is an example of that. Um, many years ago in Naples, uh, DPC began the revival of the Naples Main Street, Fifth Avenue, by releasing, convincing the town to release the parking code for 18 months. And so everybody rushed in to take advantage of it in a short amount of time. Um, in your case, maybe it's allowing some old uh, sized, too deep stores um, to become divided up, to become space, incubator spaces for uh, new kinds of retail uh, and for uh, informal retailers. Uh, we might call the kind of ways of releasing those regulations the pink zone. Um, the, new urban, the lean urbanism does that. Um, but the real problem might be how you reduce rents um, uh, and how you fill an occupied space. So the most lean, then, of this spectrum is tactical urbanism. The pop-up businesses, food trucks, weekly market, mar markets that might be incubators of future business, but active in places that um, are, we you hope, know, temporarily inactive. Um, part of that is we're going to get to a lot of these issues in yeah. our conversation. That response to constant change um, probably requires mostly um, addressing 
the bureaucratic processes. Um, and so uh, there was an article sent around about how difficult it was to do something. Um, I had several conversations with people, including my hairdresser, who might not think I have a hairdresser, but um, a wonderful person, um, has a great store in Coconut Grove, tried to set up a shop um, in Miami Beach and gave up after 18 months of having um, permitting problems, in particular with the signage. So um, that's clearly an issue to discuss, Susan. And um, if you think about lean urbanism as a way that you might release um, some of the standards that you've set that are well intended, um, but maybe actually preventing things from happening, um, I can speak to specific instances in that case. Um, but the, the process, I don't know if any of you caught my article on getting a BTR in Miami Beach. If, if you didn't, please read it. It was quite the odyssey for a couple of years. And oh, however, in the press release announcing your appointment, the city said you were charged with, quote, rolling out the red carpet for the business community and cutting out the red tape. So we'll, we'll, we'll get to that um, as we talk tonight. This conversation, this topic is daunting because of the things that are not within our control. So we look at the changing retail environment, competition, Wynwood, design district, Ripple, rising rents, rising cost of property, which is why rents have come up. Um, is this a natural evolution? Is it just too hard? Do we keep getting in our own way? Um, what's within our control of these things? that we can really focus in on, where is the opportunity for us to address this issue? Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> okay, know. there we go. So again, uh, Paul Martinez, uh, Director of Economic Development. So as stated earlier, I think the retail industry is in a state of confusion. You know, retail doesn't know exactly what, what it wants to be going forward. I mean, Go. Here we go. So the retail world is in a state of confusion. So it doesn't know what it wants to be now, what, what it wants to be going forward. One of the things you'll hear not only locally but nationally is that it's in a change, it's in a flux. So if you think about when they rolled out back in the day, I think in the 1920s and 1930s, they rolled out the big, you know, book that you got home in the mail. You know, you can order online. If you can't order online, you can, you know, order it and get shipped to you. They thought that was going to be the, the retail, the catalog. And then entering today's market, you know, they said, you know, the, the internet, the internet's going to kill retail. It's bricks versus clicks. And so that's changed how, how retail operates. And now, in today's world, the people that are on the side of the clicks are saying, you know, we want to have bricks and mortar storefront locations so we can reach more customers. So now that's evolving in the industry. I think the biggest challenge for us is how do we look at each of our retail districts, our marketplaces, not only within Miami but Beach, but also as a regional perspective. Because like Susan said, you know, we do have competition you know, on Coral Gables, Wynwood, you know, downtown Miami is taken off, you've got the design district. And every one of those are going to have its own marketplace. So I think the challenge for us is how do we differentiate ourselves from all these different places and communities? How do we set ourselves apart? What are we doing differently? How are we going to drive different consumers and different generations to the city of Miami Beach? You know, we think about millennials, which I have three of them at home. They're thrifty. They don't want to go out and buy clothes. They're not into big material things. They'd rather do something that experimental and exciting. So they, they think about food and beverage and entertainment. And that's where the industry is really going when you think about where it's, where it's at today and where it's going to go into the future. Um, two, um, from a city perspective, you know, I think there's a unique opportunity for us to work with not only within the administration and our mayor commissioners, which I see a commissioner Ariel in the back there, fellow commissioner. Um, we just really need to not only lead, but we need to be engaged with the community who really come up with a vision not only for the city of Miami Beach, but looking at every area throughout Miami Beach has its own unique marketplace. And that part of that is really just looking at the vision because at the end of the day, it may be a vacant storefront, it may be an absentee landlord. But a lot of times what happens when you see vacant storefronts, people are saying, well, it's higher rents. Well, maybe it's not higher rents. Maybe the area is starting to decline. Maybe it's failing in some places. So what we need to do is come back together as a community. What can we do to recreate that vision and bring back to where it was maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago 
and think about how we want to move forward. So I think you know it all starts with a great vision, it starts with an action plan, and then it starts working with an administration to look at what ways we can reduce the burden on business. You know, streamline processes so that we make it easier for businesses to want to come and do business here as well as working with existing ones who want to grow and expand their business. And as I said earlier, you know, one of the things that I've always said should be trademarked is just rolling out the red carpet and not the red tape. I think, you know, we have to be business friendly. I can tell you from my perspective, being in the economic development world 20 plus years as I look at it as being an entrepreneur. So I really try to wear both hats. You know, there's the policy place, there's the regulation place, and then there's the entrepreneurial place. And so in my job, I think you need to be able to really understand all the different processes, be able to leverage resources and connect the dots. And I think that's you know what we need to do going forward. Um, hopefully I answered the question. So briefly. Well, <clears throat> I've been involved in retail in Miami Beach since 1986. Um, and it, it's been a, it's really been quite an amazing journey uh, as far as where it's been on the beach. I'm going to really just talk about the beach. Um, you know, I've owned 30 stores on Washington Avenue since 1988. And my original tenants at that time were a like a, a church of some kind that was extremely local, that had a big audience in the immediate neighborhood, a Nicaraguan bakery, um, uh, nails and hair, uh, convenience retail for what was local. I mean, basically they were uh, businesses that responded to the people who were living in the community. I mean, South Beach is a small town, really, for the people who live here. And so, you know, it was responding to that. There was obviously a time when clubs became very popular in Miami Beach. And so they were the center of life here. And the retail actually responded to uh, what club goers were. So you ended up with 42 pizza places that were open at 3 o'clock in the morning and not during the day. You had a lot of clubs that were open only at night and not during the day. You had clothing stores that would keep the oddest hours because they would sell to the kids who were going to the clubs. So it became, you know, everything was based around clubs. Then I'll never forget when Michael Comrass uh, came to town and um, I saw what he was doing and I took him to lunch one day and I said, Michael, don't bring all the chains to Miami Beach because you're going to kill the character of what's on Miami Beach. And he looked at me, started laughing. He goes, you, you really don't understand this business at all. He goes, I can't finance my deals. I can't get money from the bank. I can't really make any money unless I rent to the chains. And, you know, the chains recognize the opportunity in Miami Beach, and, and they came here. And, you know, people may disagree on the benefits of having a lot of chains in Miami Beach. I'm not a big fan of the homogenization of retail throughout the world. You know, when you travel, the, the most fun thing in the world used to be to walk down whatever local street you were, whether it was in Barcelona or Paris or London or wherever you were, and there would be unique stores that were specific to that location and to the population that they were serving. Not so much anymore. Uh, so, you know, it kind of killed itself by all this mass market retail that you can find online and you can find locally. So I think the challenge really is how do we, uh, I mean retail uh, clothing is essentially dead. Uh, you know, I would say that 80% of my tenants over the years were clothing and it was a question of curating uh, new designers who had a look that they wanted to present, not you know, national chains or what have you. And I took great pride in sourcing tenants that were not typical, that, you know, you couldn't find on every other block in town. And, you know, that opportunity for clothing is pretty much over. Local clothing uh, is almost dead. And as Bo says, it's being replaced by restaurants and uh, activities where people can engage with each other. And the beach, I mean, has always had a ton of restaurants, 
but it's essentially becoming a food court out there now. And uh, you know, the question is, what are the other opportunities that are uniquely Miami Beach that respond to the population that's living here that can be successful and make enough money? And will landlords be willing to rent their spaces at prices that are affordable? I mean, I've had I had a tenant uh, that I went in and I, it was a, a foam accessory store, which I didn't even want to rent to, because to me those are fungible. I was always looking for something that was more unique. I went into him and he said, oh, let me give you this for free. I said, I don't, I don't want anything for free. He said, well, when I came into your office, you told me that <coughs> the rents were too high on most of the beach and that you were going to charge a number that I thought was ridiculously low. He said, I didn't understand why your rent was so low. And I said, well, I know how much people can afford to pay based on the foot traffic that's on the street. He goes, well, you were right. Because what happens in town is that there are crazy people out there who are willing to rent stores at whatever price, but they're not going to last. And so there's been a tremendous amount of turnover, and there's been a tremendous amount of lack of individuality. I mean, what, why is Wynwood a very successful retail community right now? Because it's authentic to the roots of the community. Why is the beach not particularly successful right now? It's lost its identity in terms of what it wanted to present. Lincoln Road became, you know, the retail center on the beach, and Lincoln Road turned into a bunch of chains, and, you know, great, okay, let's go to the Gap, let's go to Banana Republic. Did the beach have a spin on it? Yeah, because Banana Republic on Lincoln Road was in a converted uh, bank, and the vault was the dressing room. Okay, it was really cool. Uh, you know, it had a beach twist to it, but that kind of thing, how you remain authentic to the area where you're trying to do business is really what the challenge is. Um, so you've raised a number of issues that Liz, I'd like to ask here too. What is the role of government, right? Can we and should we curate? Because both Bo and Saul have mentioned national chains. Commissioner Ariola led the fight to um, not allow chain stores and chain restaurants any longer on Ocean Drive and Lincoln Road. Um, at what point is there too much interference? At what point do you let the market decide? Very multi-part question, but, but where do we where do we go? What's the role of government? Well, if, you know, I think. It's difficult for government to have a role, except insofar as there are policies of the type you say, especially because the change that retail lives by, um, like it or not, seems to be happening at um, ever accelerating pace. So even a big developer, the large retail developer who's doing a new shopping center or owning a shopping center, successfully for a long time understands that every five years there has to be a refresh and that every store needs to look new at least at that rate. Well, if it takes three years to get a permit, you're not going to have that kind of refreshing um, uh, automatically here. It's, and it is more difficult, of course, when you have multiple property owners, um, many of whom may not even live here or feel that they um, owe anything to the city. So. You know, the government can try to set up, enable, um, and encourage this kind of um, quick change uh, in various ways, whether it's reducing regulations um, or identifying a place that, that might take on a special effort to remake itself. Um, but certainly things like facade changes, merchandising, maybe supporting merchandising for the small people, and thinking about what is it about the existing building fabric that may be preventing um, change and the people who may be willing to start retail um, and be entrepreneurial? What's preventing them from happening, from working out? Uh, we, we talked about Winwood and Winwood Yard. A lot of that was organic, right? So how do we get at this unique? Again, both of you talked about what's unique to Miami Beach. How do we get there? So let me, let's just make one thing clear about Linwood, um, which is that it was always understood to be temporary. It's temporary, correct. And now there's a shock a little bit to the system, right, about this temporary nature of it. But not just Linwood Yard, but the whole place was understood to be about um, long-term investment, growth, um, 
they increased the density of it, um, and everybody understood that what started it was going to change drastically. Through, but for example, I thought you know I was doing a lot of renovation at the time, and I had a building card with all the signatures on it from all of the inspectors. I thought I should be able to hand that card to the city and get my certificate of completion and occupational license. When I started trying to simplify the process, there were four signatures that were required on the certificate of completion. When I finished sim uh, sim simplifying the process, there were 11 signatures that were required. So, you know, the system often will come back to try and bite you, but if you engage them with real problems, I know Commissioner Areola just held a uh, small business forum on how can you, uh, you know, make things more user friendly. Our focus was a little different. It was internal to the city. So we sat down with all of the city departments and said, look, these are the problems that we know firsthand. How can you help us streamline this? And, you know, a lot of it's from the top down, obviously with the city manager and the commission and the messages that they give out, and you want the message to be, how can I help you, you know, not why can I tell you why you can't do what you want to do. Unfortunately, bureaucracies, particularly building departments, are such that if something happens once in a high-rise building, in a 40-story building, and it goes badly and they sue the head of the building department, all of a sudden every process in the entire city, including a 1,000 square foot retail store renovation, becomes subject to the same rule as the 40 story high rise. So governments have a hard time uh, distinguishing categories and who should be, you know, what's really life safety and what isn't. It's a lot of dialogue internally with the city. I mean, you know, you see it, you talk to them about the problems that you had with the BTR. If you don't do it in an accusatory way, you say, hey, listen, the system is messed up. These are the problems that I have. Let's fix it together. The government will usually do that. But it's patchwork, you know? There's a whole mentality that has to go with it. It's like, we want to help you, and our reflex action should be why we can show you how to do what you want to do, not why you can't do what you want to do. Well, and, and I'll continue on with the Saul's discussion is, you know, what makes us unique is I don't want to make us unique where it's a hard place to do business. I want us to be best in class. And so that really starts with the, you know, the mayor and commissioner leading that discussion. I you know I can say that Commissioner Ariel is definitely leading that discussion. Two, we need to look at it from a policy perspective. You know, what kind of things can the city do to lead as well as work in partnership with the business community residents to really create that vision for Miami Beach, which is unique. And then how do we drill down to all the different marketplaces within Miami Beach from Ocean Drive to Collins Avenue to North Beach? I mean, these are all different places that have different unique uses and things that can really change the way we do business. And then three, you know, we want to look at how we how do we streamline the uh, BTR and C process. I know right now that they're they're hand and they work together, but it really should be separated. You know, based on Susan's uh, email to the city manager, that's something that we're working on as we speak, and we hope to actually roll out an online version of this where you know Susan can go out and apply for a BTR line, get that within 24 hours, and be ready to open for, well, not open for business, sustaining business in your case. Um, two, we're looking at um, hiring or, you know, our training staff so that we, we're all business ombudsmen so when someone walks into the city you know we're able to show you all the different steps that it takes to not only open a new business but expand your business or renew your business and so those are the things that we're working on and we're also working on putting together a top 10 guide to opening a business in Miami Beach because one of the things that you'll hear from the development community whether you're an entrepreneur or a big developer is they just want predictability they want to know the steps to get to where they want to go to open their doors from day one. And so if we can work with them hand in hand, whether it's through a development reprocess that we're working on, or putting together a guide, having workshops for small businesses that don't have, you know, the uh, things that big businesses have, because they can go out and hire an attorney, they can go out and hire designers, they can go out and hire some of that to help them curate retail and make their storefront pretty. 
So we're working with the Small Business Development Center to put together workshops for small businesses and entrepreneurs. So we're really looking at it from a very proactive approach. And I think, you know, this is going to be a work in pro progress. I don't think as government, you should never be complacent. You always got to be thinking, what's the next step and be innovative. So from that perspective, I read us being best in class when it comes to opening and operating businesses versus being unique to other the municipalities in the, in, the, in the county and the country. As you talked a little bit about at the beginning about some of the unique things and pop-ups and, and food trucks and things, how do we encourage? We, we have a, a we lament on a regular basis the loss of the mom and pops, the loss of the small businesses, right? Um, we know the challenges here with the price of real estate in particular, with the red tape. If you're opening a restaurant and if you have six months worth of runway, theoretically you should have more, but if you have six months worth of runway, it takes you six months to get open and your restaurant closes in a month or two, which is what we're, we're, we're seeing a lot of here. How do we, and where do we, encourage the small businesses um, how do we encourage some of the tech-based businesses that don't have storefronts? How do, how do we bring that into the city? That's a lot of questions in one question. It is. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think it might be worth looking around. We've already mentioned Winwood, um, but we might look at some other regional examples. So, um, downtown Coconut Grove was languishing for many years um, with overpriced storefronts, um, uh, family, many generations of family owned, uh, small increments, you know, from out of town. Um, and there were a couple things that occurred which I think got it moving. Um, one was the predictability that was brought in in terms of redevelopment through Miami 21. Um, and uh, it was no longer about a fight with every building which it used to be with the neighbors. Um, two, we did um, a retail study with Bob Gibbs, which uh, exposed the demographic that surrounded Coconut Grove, which it was not serving. Um, it was serving college students with, with beer at night and other things, but not the wealthy residents who were living there. Um, and that study um, awoke a number of people who got then involved in um, buying the real estate, remaking the places. Um, and already the office um, businesses had started coming in, into the upper levels. Uh, and that has only increased because it's been understood that it's a nice, it's a nice walkable place to be working. Um, and so three things really happened. The predictability of the city code, the policy. Um, the understanding who the clientele might be for retail. Um, that was one place, and the Miami Beach has how many different places? I think of all the things that we've been talking about, we need to acknowledge that they are geographically different, and that probably some geographic advocacy or, um, I hesitate to use the word control <coughs> management, much in the way that the um, preservation and redevelopment of the beach began many years ago with the community development. Um, corporations or districts, which were actually given the opportunity, they even had funding, I think, at some point, to really work on their areas. Um, because all the needs are different, the clientele is different, the ownership is different. Um, and so maybe thinking about it with that kind of geographic specificity, and then you can deal with things the way Open Grove um, has done. Always with the understanding that it's, whatever you do is not forever. Where is the balance, though, let me add to that for a second, where is the balance between what we are in Miami Beach, which is 90,000 residents and what, 12 to 14 million visitors in a year? And it's a bad joke, but the joke is when there's a vacancy, oh, it's going to be another surf style or another CVS. Because it services the, the tourists in the area, because it is a credit worthy business that can sign a long-term lease and banks will finance it. How do we get to this point where we attract and keep the mom and pops, what's unique to Miami Beach, yet we also have that push-pull of the tourists versus the residents? Well, it, it may not be just mom and pops that you're looking for. You, you do want to be incubating in your ways to do that, but you may also be asking people from other parts of town who've done a good job to come over 
here and start, in a sense, a franchise. Um, one of the things that we said in the beginning, someone said in the beginning is, um, comparing Miami Beach to other parts of the region. I'm not sure if it's comparison of destinations so much, because nobody wants to go anywhere by car or Uber anymore. If you can find what you want in your area, you will be perfectly happy to buy it there and not go looking for it somewhere else, because it's so hard to get around these days. Um, and so that idea that you might actually look to bring some retailers here who may be being successful somewhere else could be the equivalent in some, again, it's geographic. Um, in some areas, that might be just as effective as startups. I'm going to confess that I'm looking forward to the Target opening on Fifth Street so I don't have to drive to the town. So there, there's a need for some of these, right? I would think the thing to know is that retailers are not visionaries. And so it's really incumbent upon the city as well as the community really to develop that vision. And I think once you see one retailer come, then others like to follow. So it's having that conversation with those startup businesses that open up their first business and now looking for going from a first generational to a second store generation type business. Um, two, um, we really got to look at how do we work with the property owners and developers to tell the story of Miami Beach because our story is a lot different than Wynwood. Our story is a lot different than the design district. And we happen to have this really beautiful beach that no one else has. So there's a lot, of, a lot more assets that I can say that are in this community that you won't find in any other community. We've got great buildings. We've got an international city. So I think you know there's a lot to talk about here. So we really need to create a pitch deck you know, everything, why Miami Beach? One, we've got, you know, a great population. Two, we've got a lot of visitors. Three, we're very international. Four, we've got this great architecture, we've got these great streets. And then I think the fifth is that we need to really focus on how we improve the public transportation infrastructure network. I think that's going to be very important as we look to diversify the economy here in Miami Beach. So one, we're not too rely, uh, rely on tourism because so goes the economy, so goes tourism, so goes people spending. So I think it's incumbent upon us to really look at how we diversify, diversify the economy so that we, we can go out and, and attract the tech people, people that are IT into software, telecommunications, professional and business services, energy, transportation. All those sectors are growing, including healthcare. So how do we? make ourselves be part of that game. So I think it comes with a bigger plan and a bigger vision. I think that's something that, you know, we're gonna to continue to work on today and going to the future. When I came on board, I said, no, one of the things that we should do right away is really work with the community to develop an economic development strategy for the city. And then from that strategy, we start drilling down into these different areas throughout the city and marketplaces and really create that vision. Because if we wait for retail to lead, we're gonna be very disappointed. But if we create that vision and lead ourselves, that I think they'll follow. Well, it's interesting. <clears throat> um, the neighborhoods on the beach that are successful, uh, by and large, uh, are going well by themselves, right? But by definition. But the ones that aren't, the city is getting involved in the geo bond, in really trying to recreate uh, a better urban experience. I mean, after all, detail at the end of the day amounts to what's a place that you want to walk down the street and find it enjoyable. So that means generally more greenery, you know, and landscaping and shade than we typically have. Uh, partially because all the store owners are crazy that their signs are going to be obscured by the trees. Um, I think people will still find their stores if they're walking on the street. Uh, beach could be a little more bike oriented. But I mean, look, 41st Street is getting a major capital infusion as part of the geo bond. So is Washington Avenue, so is Ocean Drive, and so is 71st Street. So the four commercial areas that are the most problematic right now are, if it were a mall, you know, the mall owner would reinvest in trying to recreate a new identity here, since it's individual buildings, the city is playing a constructive role in trying to reinvest in how to reimagine that street as a more walkable street. But I mean, there's some exciting things. For example, um, 
For the first time, we're starting to look, I think, at South Beach Entertainment District as its own district. Not Ocean Drive as a street, not Collins Avenue as a street, not Washington Avenue as a street, but the Entertainment District as a whole. Which street really should be the transportation street? Which street should be predominantly the retail? Which one should be right on the ocean that's Ocean Drive? I mean, there are unique characteristics, but it's broken right now. And it needs to be fixed. And it needs to be fixed by having the business owners sit down together with the city and with the money that's going to be invested and figure out how to make it more attractive to people. Because at the end of the day, no retail is going to be successful if you don't have people walking by. And right now, the foot traffic during the day is really not there. And that's the reason that the retail is not successful on Washington or Collins and Ocean, you know, has its own issues. So how do you generate more foot traffic? You have to make the destination more attractive to people. If we're looking at doing it in a reimagining the urban setting, which is what Liz is really so good at. So why don't you come and help us, Liz? <laughs> And I think it's a fine balance between uh, nationals and locals. I mean, you, you've got to have a little bit of both. And then two, you've also got to uh, figure out the day and nighttime uses, because if you have good daytime traffic, then those businesses, such as Saul just talked about, are going to succeed. But you also need some nighttime activity as well. So it's, it's a blend of both. But it, there's no really magic wand that you can put out there and things will happen. I think you just have to continually work on them and continue to involve them and you know hopefully you know as we move forward we'll be in a good place going, going into the future. Let's discuss the vacant storefront question because it, this drives me crazy. Um, personally I, I don't believe there's a role for government at all in the vacant storefront. Uh, I, I can't imagine anything I would like less as a property owner trying to curate my own stores, to having the government tell me when I'm supposed to rent my store and start taxing me if they don't think I rent it fast enough. But I'll keep my stores empty until I find a tenant that I think is going to be additive to the collection of tenants that I'm creating and trying to curate an environment. But if the government's breathing down my neck and saying, hey, we're going to tax you if you don't rent it, well, how is that going to help? I'm just going to rent to another vape store, I mean, or another scooter store, or another tattoo store. I mean, you know, Lord knows we have enough of those. So the challenge as a landlord is to find things that we don't have that would be more unique, that would be more attractive to people, and have a collection of stores that are edited with each other. The government has no role in that as far as I'm concerned. Perspective. I think you know. One, I think we started earlier on about looking at policy, 
Two, predictability. And three, you know, how can we make sure that we're providing the information to opening up a business in Miami Beach from step one to step 10, or how many steps that, are, that is. But at the end of the day, it's, it's really us blowing out the red carpet red tape. I won't say that again, but um, it really just, it's, it starts with conversations. It starts with going out and talking with the people and then we would open up a successful restaurant. And let them know that one, we've got great demographics, we've got great spending power, we've got 12 to 14 million tourists that are coming to Miami Beach every day. And yet, we want to keep it every year. I'm sorry, every year they keep it every day. <laughs> but we want to keep it local, but sometimes keeping it local, you also want to have that regional approach because you also want people to come over from the Bay to Miami Beach and, and spend money. So I think there's a lot of just different factors that we have to consider, but I think data is a very, very important component to economic development uh, in Miami Beach. Well, the other thing is that those studies about vacant stores on the beach are very misleading. Uh, first of all, on Washington Avenue, because of the zoning changes that uh, the, the Blue Ribbon Panel together with the Commission adopted, there's two very wonderful projects that are under construction right now, one in the 600 block and one in the 900 block. Uh, both micro hotel projects, which will have kind of thematic retail below. Um, but when those projects are, you know, being, the development is being planned, one of them had 14 empty stores and the other had 14. So that's 28. I think the number in the city was 80 or something. So right away you have two development projects that are ongoing, that are happening, that have 35% of what the city said was a total vacancy. So, you know, you can't count vacancy like that, not for projects that are, have active des design review or star preservation board approvals and active building permit than just getting the financing together or what have you. So, you know, that's one class of thing. I mean, you do have some landlords who are, I mean, they're holding out for, uh, you know, a tenant. Lincoln Road, for example, uh, Stephen Mattel. I mean, I, I'm sorry, but I, I will name names. You know, he, he's had 15 empty stores for the longest time. He's held, he, want, he, he wants to reimagine what his stores will be. He wants to redevelop them, but, you know, if it were me, I would rent them out short term until I had my development concept, you know, put together and sign a series of short term leases with people. And sometimes, you know, when you're doing short term leases, you can get creative people who don't want to necessarily commit, want to test out the market, see if their concept is going to be successful. But I mean, it, you know, it's been financially very successful for him in a, in a market that was going up, in a market that's going down you know, which is kind of where the retail market is generally uh, on the beach at the moment, maybe not quite so successful a strategy. So I think that the market's always going to dictate to developers, you know, what they can and can't do. I mean, I think the bigger problem is that uh, you have foolish tenants who are willing to pay rents that they can't really afford sometimes, and they sign a lease and they go in and they go out of business within a year, and then everybody goes, well, what's, the, what's wrong with this street? And then it gets a bad rap because there's too many empty stores. Well, if you rent it to people that rents they can afford to pay based on the foot traffic and based on the sales per square foot, then you're more apt to generate a dynamic retail community. So I'm going to um, ask one question and then come down to the audience. Tony, since we're down the microphone, I'm going to just bring one down um, to get to the audience questions. But here's to get us started on this. The city has made a big push for pedestrianization. Pedestrians first, walkable city. One of the things we hear about that is that means retail or something on that first floor that keeps people moving. Is that a little counterintuitive that as retail is going through the changes it's going through, that we're requiring that these first floors have some kind of activation, but if we don't do it, then you have these dead zones where pedestrians don't want to walk. So let's talk about that and I'll come down there. So um, that's a kind of vision and design question. Um, I think uh, one of the, although 
those kinds of rules have been set up in order to encourage pedestrians and pedestrianization. Um, I think one thing that we've understood very early on is that that can't take place everywhere. There's a limited amount of um, successful retail um, that any place can have. And identifying what that amount is and focusing um, those rules on the areas where that can really happen, um, where um, the trajectory is relatively short and pedestrian friendly, it's not gonna happen everywhere. And then how you, um, what you allow or what you encourage on the first floors in those in between or other areas uh, is part of the question. But I think it's identifying what's the geography of focus um, that is best for the retail of that specific piece of the city. Okay, let's go with audience questions. Um, Herb, we'll start with you. <laughs> I'm Frank, I'm the board and each and I. So I'm wondering what the city and the people who own the stores are doing to find the tenants. Like looking in Santa Monica, California, Coney Island, Atlantic City, Myrtle Beach, to find out what's going on in those cities and who's renting. Well, I think any good landlord or any good urbanist uh, does a lot of traveling to many other communities to see what works in other communities. Uh, but picking up on something that Liz said before, um, in the early days in South Beach, yeah, we used to try and find successful retailers from Coconut Grove, from Carl Gables, from the immediate area, not so much Santa Monica, or Hollywood or what have you, but some of that as the beach, uh, you know, grew larger. So, yeah, find a retailer with one or two or three locations and see if you can get them to open up a fourth and kind of create a little mini chain. I mean, your chances as a landlord of having a successful tenant with two or three other stores is much higher than, you know, I, I generally won't rent to somebody who's the first time opening their business, or unless you sit down with them and they really have a business plan and they know what they're doing. I mean, you can't just rent to the first person that walks in off the street, even if they're willing to pay the rent, if they have no idea what they're doing. And there's a lot of that up there, believe me. People just want to open the store, and there are landlords who don't care. If they're willing to pay the rent, that's fine, but vacancy is the main of you know, property owners out of the city. So yeah, I mean, brokers do a lot of that, or not necessarily the property owners. They got a book, they look through, and they see, you know, where the national tenants are, where the regional tenants are, but I don't think that that's gonna solve the problem in Miami Beach. I think we again have to get back to our authentic roots and find out, you know, what is for Miami Beach, not necessarily what's generic and is working in so many other locations. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the conversation, is I think you know we need to have a strong vision for place. Um, two, uh, we need to work very closely with the property owners, brokers, site selectors, as well as being proactive on our own, so that people know we're open for business. Two, we should probably take a look at opening in this location. Three, here's a landlord that's very interested in this type of use, and just really understanding the marketplace as a whole. And I, and I think, you know, the other part of it is making sure you have good data and information that you can share with them because a lot of people really truly don't understand the marketplace and we as a city should be able to understand that best. And so I think that's providing information, marketing materials, and just really pitching and selling the city. And I, you know, I, when I came from Denver to Miami Beach, I'm like, hey, I could be come to, come to a better place. It's an international city with great name recognition and I think it should be an easy sell, but again, it's all this stuff has to come together as one. Okay, over, over, over here. Uh, three quick uh, questions, and then a, uh, one big, one big problem. Um, how can you, first of all, start looking at how do you allow uh, single crew workplaces to, to open up? Like Mike and Patty's is the best sandwich shop in Boston. Uh, Mike serves and Patty cooks. The place is tiny. Uh, second, how do you actually? Uh, can you actually consider uh, just having a shop first 
uh, 12 or 15 feet of the space rather than having to lease the whole space. Uh, and then also, how can you look at selling more experiences uh, and less stuff? Uh, because that's what people are buying more. And the big question is this, and that is, is that how do you actually, and, and so I really appreciate what you were trying to do with the permit process, but how can we actually help the city get serious about the building permit? We had a large one about the business world in South Beach. Anybody who had a problem with the building department would come to me. And so you know, I have a lot of experience in hearing what people's problems are trying to get permits. I would say 80% of the situations, the problem has to do with the architect not responding to the city comments properly and the owner not understanding how to be on top of his team of professionals to get them to respond to the city comments. The city comments are online now and anybody can see them and you can track what's happening with your permit. Um, and the city process has gotten a lot better than it used to be. The walkthrough process is much better, the drop-off process works a lot better, but it takes somebody with some knowledge to manage it, and if you choose an architect as an out-of-town developer, the architect's not local, doesn't know how the process works, yeah, theoretically, it, you know, it should work for anybody, even if they're from out of town or if they're not familiar, but you know, the reality is if you take somebody, you have an architect and you have an expediter and they know the system, they can get you a permit pretty quickly if you're willing to comply. One of the things that the city is putting together is a development review committee and that committee is going to give opportunities and develop, uh, the development committee an opportunity to come in and meet with the city pre-application. So that way, you know, you can meet with building, you can meet planning, you can meet transportation, you can meet economic development and all the different disciplines that are going to affect your project. And so what the plan is there is to really one, look at your project up front, let you know what steps you need to take in order to make your project successful and working partnership with the city. Two, helping you put together a timeline and predictability. And three, to eliminate surprises, because what I'm hearing from a lot from the development community years, you know, we get in the middle of a project and all of a sudden we get now understand that everyone has all these different requirements and that slows down the project. Now we're into it another year, then another year, and then we're into three years, which makes it very difficult. So I think that process will help um, streamline um, everything for the development community. But you know, it's again, I think Saul made a really great point. Um, it's incumbent upon the developer too to make sure that they have an experienced team because if you bring someone in from out of town, they don't understand our processes. Guess what? It's going to slow down your process. But at the end of the day, I think the ultimate goal is to really take out the surprises and really work in partnership with you all on the timeline to deliver your project. Does it always need a developer? No. Okay, then one, one more here, and then we're going to move on. Good afternoon, Christian. Let's have for a shop. Uh, I've had a surf shop down here since 2008, which, if you know what uh, Miami Beach is like for waves, you know that we're in a desert for waves, so that's been a little bit challenging. Um, long time resident. Graduate of Treasure Island, Nautilus of Beach High. Uh, I've worked these beaches my whole life, and I've seen a lot of these challenges kind of uh, not only just affect me, but the city overall. Um, I'm going to make a couple comments in that question for Saul. Um, in regards to all the other townships and municipalities off the beach of ha having things happen from your Brickles to your Windwoods and stuff like that, and even Windwood, we try our hand at doing a little retail spot in Windwood as well. Yes, I think a lot of the attraction there is that everything's newer, being developed and built. There's a lot of uh, want for people to come there to create. But as a retail on the clothing side, it's still not there yet because there aren't hotels, there aren't apartment buildings that allow for people in an urbanism kind of way to be able to walk. So you're going to Winwood as a destination. What are you doing at Winwood? It's a big treasure map. It's all beautiful artistry and whatnot. Then at that point, you need a drink or you need a food and stuff like that. So food and beverage works in that point. Because just on 2nd Avenue, on Northwest 2nd, rents are getting there from 75 to 100 a square foot. You have companies like Shinola that has money that was on 2nd Avenue that has to leave. So the, it, I wouldn't say Winwood's all that great in regards to retail. But one of the things that the beach has that none of these places have, aside what you guys are mentioning, is the actual ocean room itself. Right? We're always going to have that. Miami Beach has always been a destination for that. What we don't have to do is build more here because everything's already built. All these areas are still creating and they have to go through cycles before they get to go ahead and do this trial and error of what works and what doesn't work. Challenges here on the beach are have been highlighted in both forms where uh, real estate pricing has gotten so high that it makes it difficult. This comes back to the question that we saw. 
Uh, but aside of that, you have the uh, streamlined process uh, being difficult for permitting and whatnot. Uh, we tried to have our hand at a 170 square foot little spot a few years back, and all we were doing was a change in use. There was no impact whatsoever, no bathrooms, 170 square feet. Um, and it was an office changing it to retail. It took me four months to walk the process. There was nothing, there was no build out, no construction, no impact whatsoever. It took me four months of me walking, I'm pretty diligent. I'm pretty smart about who I have to speak to about whatnot, and it took me forever. So stuff like that needs to happen. Also, one of the challenges. Let me, let me just stop there. I agree, change of use is very unwieldy, and the county has a lot to do with that. It's not just the beach. Absolutely. And anytime you get two different municipalities involved, so the county and the beach, it becomes more difficult. I give you one funny story. When I was on the commission, it used to have to, when you get an asbestos survey, when you're doing demolition, you had to go to the county to get the county to sign off on it and then come back to the beach. I said, well, why can't the beach sign off on it? Most of the time, the inspection shows that there's no asbestos. What rocket scientist do you need to look at the report that says there's no asbestos? I said, no, 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 it can't be done. Well, I went down with the assistant city manager, spoke to Durham, said, would you give the beach the authority to sign off on it so people don't have to leave the beach and they just get it approved on the beach and they don't have to go to Durham? They said, absolutely, no problem. Shock and all. Okay, so they did it for the four years I was on the commission. The year I left, they changed it and said we're not doing it anymore. So, you know, I don't know. The bureaucracies have a mindset of their own that they, um, they said that the beach wasn't, they weren't, it was a revenue stream for Durham that they lost by letting the beach take over the responsibility of reviewing the asbestos report. So these bureaucracies need to make money off of the stream of people trying to do projects, and that's unfortunately a reality. You need people, you know, who are outspoken, like Commissioner Ariola, to beat them over the head and tell them they can't do that anymore. Right. So the question I have, aside again, I think businesses that are that are being built here, unfortunately nowadays, it used to be the mom and pop, it was their livelihood that was that was the reason why they built whatever it is. Nowadays, it's not livelihood anymore. It's either a passion project or it's for whatever reason a lot of businesses are being built not for that mom and pop value anymore. Um, uh, the question I have more so for you, because I find it sometimes challenging with some landlords or, or with certain properties, they don't necessarily own the property that they're at. So they have to go off of what market value is going. And I feel like sometimes there's certain landlords that do own the building that they have a little bit more wiggle room on being able to lower the price per square foot. This is where I feel like Bo's position is probably one of the most important in the city because if he's able to create this special permitting process where you're able to create pop-ups, you're able to go ahead. I don't think you have to go to Santa Monica and all these places. I think there's plenty of people that are creative that have the, the ability to do stuff here, but they're red tape or it's too expensive to be able to try their hand at it. And so if there's an opportunity to be able to curate and give people the opportunity to kind of go there and express themselves, it starts to change, I think, the demographics of the beach because you're changing it from the businesses that are coming out that are attracting the main managers to come back to the beach. Because again, you don't have to build the infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, the, the mayor's office is very active in uh, trying to facilitate pop-ups on the beach right now. So if you know anyone that wants to do that, tell them to see Michelle because uh, they really are trying to encourage it. I just want to say one other thing about the beach and permitting that I think gives the beach a bad rap about it. I think it's not, with developers in particular, I think it's not so much the trying to get a building permit. I think it's dealing and navigating the land use boards, which is a you know, historic preservation board, design review board, the zoning board. Um, and as somebody who sat on those boards for 10 years and has a vision of the beach as being a tropical environment and not wanting to see it overdeveloped, I, I was an artist on those boards for uh, people that I thought were coming in to um, build a project that was overly large or wasn't sympathetic to the environment in which it was going to be built in. And I think that's a good thing for the beach. I think that um, our, in order to strengthen our brand, if we try to build our way out of it, we're going to lose our brand. And so, you know, there's a disagreement. Commissioner Ariola and I totally disagree, I think, on this subject. Um, and, and so I think that the people who sit on the boards who are appointed by the commission, you know, it's a lagging 
indicator. So the commission that's there now has had four years to populate the boards with people who think like they do, and I think that more development is happening on the beach. Um, and so maybe people would say that that's good, but not all development is good, and the boards were created for a reason to try and put businesses through a process to make sure that the development that's going to come out on the other side is a good development. And I think that's a, a lofty goal, and I think it's something that separates Carl Gables and the beach from most of the other municipalities in the area. And so I think developers sometimes mistake that and say, oh, this, this review process by the boards is so impossible, we can't do business on the beach. And, and, and they focus on that, and then they say, well, it's really hard to get a permit on the beach, because that's part of the same thing. You remember there's two sizes, large and small. And you're talking about mom and pop businesses and individual, small individual property owners. It's not always the developers. So this issue of um, bureaucracy might be parsed in terms of, of size and who the who the applicants, who the people working are. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't hurt the people to have an ombudsman for small business that. You know, some, a small business person trying to get a permit could go to the ombudsman who worked in the building department and try and facilitate it and explain the process to people who may be unfamiliar with it. And Commissioner Ayala will support this. We are moving towards that developing ombudsman position and a point of contact for small business, but all business in Miami Beach. Except for what I tell you, this is how politics works on the beach. The last time that happened, and we wanted to create an ombudsman for small business, it ended up becoming an ombudsman for homeowners that wanted to get a permit to do something in their home because homeowners vote, small business owners not so much. So, and that you know, it became like three hours in the afternoon, three days a week for homeowners who could come there and get a permit, except that. Most of them have expediters and they didn't come in the afternoon anyway. And it became time that really wasn't productive for the building department. So again, it has to be worked out jointly between the, build, the city people and the small business owners and the developers. Complicated subject. Okay, so that, that will be one of, one of those jobs. I think that is one of the things we've talked about um, in the city as well is the, the voters, the business people who often don't live here, and yet provide tax revenue that allows a lot of things to happen here in the city, right? So we've got that, that, that push-pull uh, going on. Last audience question. All right, Joe, go ahead the last question. So one here, and then Joe. Hold on, I've got one here, and then you. Thank you. It's always something I do to uh, make, make a run for politics again. <laughs> sure. I'm uh, terrible with it, I can Thank you. So um, just a statement and then a question, I think. Yeah, definitely hit on a lot of key points, uh, especially the data. And one thing that we haven't really mentioned about yet is the a reassessment of property taxes. And if you go back and probably look at even Sunset Harbor, probably next year when all those pass-throughs go through on the cam, a lot of these guys aren't going to make it. And perfect example, if you go along the Collins Corridor where they used to have all these retail stores, 735 Collins Avenue went from a $2.8 million assessment in 2016 to 9 .8 in 2017. That pass-through kills the stores. And that, that property, the land building, the three-story building is now with the bank, and they just couldn't absorb that tax. So that money is going to the county. It wasn't even budgeted, right? So they're not budgeting for that excess tax when it's reassessed. And it's certainly not coming back to the beach. So I think that that's something that's a lot larger of an issue that government needs to be involved in, you know, from the commission standpoint. But how, how is government going to be involved in that? I mean, the assessment is the assessment based on what the appraiser determines the market value is. I, I'll tell you what, sorry, I, I'll tell you what a lot of the problem is, okay? I could sound like a hero up here. I bought my property in 1988 for $40 a foot. Okay, the rents are forty dollars a foot. I make my money back every year. I can afford to be choosy. Somebody who bought their property for sixteen hundred dollars a foot has a lot of different pressures on them than somebody who bought early. So, you know, the time of property owners who've owned forever on the beach 
as time goes on, there are fewer and fewer of those people, and the people who pay a lot more money have a lot more economic pressure on them. I don't pass, I don't pass the pass through, through to my tenants if I don't think they can afford it. But I can afford to do that. But a lot of people, if they bought recently and the, and the expenses go up, they have to pass it through. But you have to ask yourself as a landlord if my tenant is going to go out of business and he's not going to be paying me any money, am I better off collecting the base rent that he's paying and not passing the pass through through? I mean, landlords have to understand what market rent is and when the rent that they're charging, including pass throughs, exceeds market and make it it's a common sense business decision about whether to pass it through or not. Okay, Joe. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Joe Manning, I'm Rosalind Devotion Drive. I have a question. I'm not sure I heard something correctly. So, did you say that if storefronts are vacant, nobody pays taxes? I didn't say that. No. I thought you did. But somebody's paying the taxes when the, the storefronts are vacant, right? Yeah, the landlords pay the real estate okay, taxes. I, I, I have news for you. The way. Oh, I said I wasn't in favor of an additional tax that the government would impose on property owners for keeping their stores vacant. Okay. But I'll tell you, most of the property on Miami Beach, particularly the smaller buildings, the 90% of the assessment, 95% of the assessment is on the land, not on the improvements. So, uh, you know, whether the store is operating or not, they're generally almost not looking at cash flow, they're looking at potential resale value, and if people are looking to buy property and assemble it, the price for the land is high in relation to what the rent is that you can generate, and the taxes are going to be justified, and it's a squeeze. It's a squeeze on the property owners when that happens. Thank you for the clarification. I have a quick comment about chain stores. There are chain stores and there are chain stores. There's some good ones, there's some bad ones, there are some chain stores that are just money longer. I would rather have a drugstore any day of the week and a surf stop. Thank you. But do you want six drug do you want six drug stores in an eight block area? All right, we're gonna do kind of some quick rounds of questions because this topic is, is generating a lot of interest. Rick Kendall. So I've been involved with the Beacon Council for 15 years and the city of Miami Beach only shows up for Gallus. Never been involved. Uh, Elizabeth, have you ever seen Miami Beach involved with it? I mean, so uh, hopefully both is kind of a comment and a question. I don't see you there, it's going to be a big failure. Ricky, we'll see you there. I actually attended the first meeting on the first week on, on the job, met with Michael Finley and his team. We're going to continue that conversation because I think, one, they're a great resource. Two, how can we leverage them? And how can we make them work for Miami Beach? Because at the end of the day, if we're looking to diversify our economy, you know, everything kind of goes through Miami. I mean, uh, the Beacon Council, be it Enterprise Florida. So. I see them as a, a big partner going forward um, as, as we do our work. So I will be there, or my staff will be there. Hi. So I'm a young entrepreneur. I'm 31 years old. I've been a long-standing city of Miami Beach resident for the last 10 years. I recently opened up a restaurant in Miami Beach on Washington Avenue. And it was tough to navigate through the whole permitting process, at least for me, that I'm so young. Um, Which restaurant? It's called Biscayne Cowboys. Yes. So it was tough to navigate through the whole the permitting process, uh, and there was a few surprises along the road. Even though I hired a pretty experienced uh, lead, uh, lawyer, and um, now going through all the permitting process, I was finally able to open up the store. And unfortunately, I lost most of the ice season. Now the summer and the hot weather is coming, and the hurricane season. Um, I just found out that actually I need to get my legal license approved uh, by the residents. There was something new that my lawyer unfortunately didn't mention me. So I have a hearing um, in a couple of weeks from now. And I'm just curious, like, I didn't really understand, maybe I was confused, but I'm, I'm just curious to understand what is the city doing to help young entrepreneurs, mom and pops, and uh, small businesses. Well, we want to take the guessing out of opening a business in the city of Miami Beach, so you know, we you know had the town hall meeting, meetings like this help us understand the business issues that are impacting you, not only as an entrepreneur, but 
find opening a business or if you're an existing business owner, renewing it and reinvesting in the community. So I think one of the things that we're going to be doing is, like I said, we're going to develop that. I don't want to call it a top 10, but a, a guide to opening up a business in Miami Beach. Two, we need to have a conversation with the county, as I mentioned in an earlier example of the asbestos uh, example. I think we need to continue to have that conversation because we can streamline our process, but then if you go to the county and have challenges, that's just going to slow you down. So I think we need to work hand in hand. And I don't want to say that's wishful thinking. I think it's a conversation we have to have. And three, uh, we're just looking at how do we streamline all our processes? Because I hear you, a lot of clear predictability is very important. Let's eliminate the surprises because no one wins when you pass surprises. But is your problem because you're within certain uh, proximity to a school or a house of worship? And yes. when you signed your lease, no one explained to you that you needed to get it. So, Can again, I, you know. There's a modification of the variance that I have to do. Yeah, but either the, your landlord should have explained it to you, the real estate broker should have explained it to you, your lawyer should have explained it to you, the city should have explained it to you, somebody should have explained it to you very early on in the process because that's a very common problem that people have. So I'm sorry that that, that didn't happen. Where is your restaurant? You didn't tell us. 13th on Washington. 13th on the west side? On the west side, right next to the post office. Right next to the post office. Good luck to you. Thank you. Okay, we're over here for question one. So um, this is many more comments uh, directed towards Bo and, and Commissioner Ariola with maybe some input from Liz. Uh, I think what we're, there are so many different types of business that are coming or could come to Miami Beach, but I think what we residents are really missing are the really cool, funky, unique, place-making, character-building, um, standalone, or maybe one of two or three small businesses that don't exist anyplace else and um, are unique to the city. And I, you know, I think some of you have heard me say this before, that we try to treat everything in Miami Beach as a one-size-fits-all city, and it's not. I mean, North Beach and South Beach have very different needs and interests and opportunities. And it would be really great to see, as you develop your program, Bo, and as you reach out to entrepreneurs and set guidelines and put together ombudsmen and reach out to whoever you're going to be reaching out to, that, that it's not just like, hey, the city is open for business. It's different parts of the city are, are looking for different kinds of things. Because I think that you know you, you want to put the right thing into the right neighborhood. And, and um, in, in this transition period, while there is so much vacant retail right now and so much empty space, um, to your point, Saul, there's some owners who are not going to want to be flexible. But I really, if there's a way to put together a program, maybe, maybe Liz, you can address this a little bit about how we can um, utilize the existing space in innovative ways temporarily. Maybe it's, you know, it's something that was built to be a retail space, but now it's going to be a performance space. Or it's built to be, you know, whatever, a warehouse, but it's actually going to be a, a, a dance studio. I, I don't know what, the, what it is, but how do we make it more engaging and, and open? Uh, you know, I don't know your zoning code the way I know some others locally, but um, if you have to go to the county for use change, you know, or it's a comprehensive plan issue, you should probably, probably just rewrite the code so that mixed use in general is allowed in these specific areas, so in these geographic areas where you want activity to happen, so you don't have to be um, getting zoning changes or occupation changes. And likewise, parking requirements, uh, you know, which often get attached to different kinds of uses, change the use.